It's significant that Mesa Verde National Park was established in 1906 by Congress because in 1906, the National Park Service doesn't exist, okay? These sites are being run by, anybody want to take a guess? Who runs Mesa Verde National Park if the National Park Service is not even going to start existing for another decade at this point? Do you know? Organizations like the United States military, that's right, the U.S. Cavalry, trained in open land survival and bridge engineering and all sorts of other stuff, including how to make people unalive. Well, as it turns out, a whole lot of uh, the skills of being an army ranger transfer over to being a park ranger, just with less shooty bits going on for the most part. Not always, but for the most part. Okay, so. It's a 52,000 acre park, that's a minor typo, um, or a 5200 acre park, anyway. And as you can see, there are 5,000 archaeological sites, individual sites where stones were placed on other stones to be part of a dwelling, or very commonly a granary, just like a pocket in the rock where you could store a bunch of grain. You used to grow a bunch of corn out here, and the climate has shifted. It'd be really hard to grow corn at Mesa Verde these days. Okay, but they did just fine without synthetic fertilizers, or green revolution, and pesticides, and stuff like that. Really interesting insights, okay? And out of those 5,000, over 10% are cliff dwellings. So, that's a whole lot of, like, cozy bungalow with a nice desert view kinds of real estate opportunities that the Mesa dwellers were able to enjoy. This is part of Puebloan culture, which is sort of the ancestral super tribe, if you want to think of it that way, for a bunch of modern tribes. Navajo, Ute, Southern Ute, Paiute, um, all sorts of them. Okay, so from kind of dark ages to middle ages, early middle ages, this was a thriving, busy place. Chaco Canyon had streets that are like, what, 40 feet wide? Like, that's a lot of people living in any place where the streets have to be 40 feet wide to handle the congestion, okay? There is trade going through here way down into South America, way up into Canada, and so forth. This is a highly connected, advanced indigenous culture, okay? So, what happened? Climate shifted. And the ancestral Puebloans went away. Okay. As you can see, it's a very blocky set of polygons on the map. And as you know as foresters, Congress in its wisdom didn't really worry too much, didn't spend a lot of time awake at night wondering how can we delineate this place according to its watershed and ecological functional boundaries. John Wesley Powell, great explorer of the American Southwest, kind of around this area, has been advocating for decades to, hey guys, these western states, divide them along ecological lines or you're going to have problems for the rest of eternity. And Mesa Verde was set aside in that time when Congress was really working hard to ignore people, smart people like John Wesley Powell. So, this makes management of this place today, over 100 years later, a challenge. That's a thing. All right, so this is Cliff Palace. Let's get this out of the way. This is the famous spot that everybody has seen or even been to. Um, I've walked through there half a dozen times on summer camp. Um, this is like this is like a cultural center. This is not where most people are living. This is full of circular structures called kiva. And kiva are like town hall slash church slash spiritual retreat site slash um, like war party planning. Like this is where people gather to do the business and living and work of being um, what we call ancestral Puebloan. And so these kiva are very, very, very important. 
And Cliff Palace, that we were just looking at, has one of the highest densities of Kiva anywhere that's been found, period. This place, by virtue of being well protected and recessed into cliff faces, and these natural rock shelters, that we have similar kinds of rock shelters, even at the same scale of in southern Illinois. I mean, we've got dozens of sites big enough to handle Cliff Palace here in southern Illinois. We sort of come across this, Western settlers and explorers come across this, and they're like, oh, wow, this is interesting and different. Let's kind of loot it pretty hard and then, you know, set it aside. Um, in so many words, over so many decades. And uh, it's a really, really cool spot to contemplate how big time is, how big the American landscape is, and how small each of us is relative to that, right? Many generations living and dying here and just gone now. But there are traces of their culture in pretty, pretty deep and impressive collection here. So we've got structures and these structures and what we've been able to infer from the descendant cultures of the ancestral Puebloan, um, we have a pretty good sense of what life was like. There are a lot of unanswered questions. What caused that shift from ancestral Puebloan culture, which was a major functional civilization like the Mayans, like the Incans, and so on and so forth, all throughout the Americas, right? Very successful cultures. Um, Cahokia Mounds, right? Right out our back door here in southern Illinois. A huge and interconnected trading culture. We have some of these remains, uh, or vestiges or traces of them that have only partially been corrupted by more recent people, usually Western settlers coming in and carving stuff up on top of them or scattering those sites. Okay. So, how do we manage it? Um, the concern here isn't so much an outstanding resource in terms of natural resource value. This is totally a cultural site, right? The Southwest has, you know, other mesas to visit for the sake of visiting mesas. Uh, Monument Valley, a very, very famous area with um, very specific mesas that are kind of the stereotype mesa. That's Monument Valley. It's like maybe a couple hours from here, maybe. Um, there are other mesas. There are what, there are thousands of miles of butte uh, crest line or cliff line in this area and around it, right? So this is staunchly a cultural archaeological site. And the problem is natural weathering starts to undermine these rock structures that people have built over time and naturally they start to crumble a little bit, right? And so in cases where the Park Service figures that the best protection is benign neglect, you can just let stuff grow over. This is exactly the strategy that SIU has adopted for Civilian Conservation Corps built trails and staircases over in Touch of Nature, for example. So those Civilian Conservation Corps things, which were built in like the 1930s, well, they're just shy of 100 years old and they're protected by the exact same laws that protect this. This is also predicted by some Native American focused legislation as well, but like the Antiquities Act, stuff like that, um, archeological preservation laws cover both of those equally. So it's a problem when our recreation, our scrambling over those rocks and every once in a while, one in a million visits, Somebody knocks one of those rocks over, or their kid scrambles up it and they get the photo, and as they're jumping down, they push off and the rock tumbles behind the wall and nobody sees it. That is a permanent impact. And so we gotta get a bunch of archeologists there to figure out exactly where that one stone should go back to, right? I mean, painstaking work, painstaking work. And the specific issue is all of the behaviors we do not appreciate called depreciative behaviors. Depreciation in your assets, go talk to your financial advisor so you can retire someday, 
Depreciation is when the value of your assets goes down. So like the stock market takes a downturn and you still own the same number of shares. But everybody's kind of suffering a little bit. So if you pull all of those shares out into cash value, the cash that you'll get out of that after that depreciation is less than you would have gotten the day before. So depreciation, bad, right? Depreciation, lowering the value of irreplaceable, unique archaeological resources, like really bad. This is like five alarm fire for the National Park Service. There are a few things that the Park Service cannot allow to happen. There are a few things that the Park Service, those are the hills it will die on, and this is one of them. Okay? So, depreciative behavior, inappropriate use, horsing around, playing around, just being an idiot on irreplaceable cultural sites like this, real problem. So we got a couple of options for that, and we'll talk about those in a bit. So the impact to the facilities, the infrastructural resources, the built environment that we have added to Mesa Verde, like the road, like the visitor center, like the campgrounds, like the trails, like the ladders that take you into and out of Cliff Palace, you actually drop down from the top and you go down to that sort of grotto. Uh, grotto is a shallow cave where sunlight hits the back. Um, we've added that stuff. That's all modern, right? And they're constantly updating that stuff, but making it look park architecturies so you're not focusing on that ladder. But they update stuff because every once in a while, grandma or grandpa has a heart attack down at Cliff Palace. And, you know, funny for us, comedy is somebody else's tragedy, it's been said. But think about if somebody has a heart attack down there, you can't get a helicopter down there. There's no road that goes there. So somebody who was having a perfectly nice vacation is now turning blue and getting colder because it can take hours to get somebody out of there. Hours. So there's this infrastructure question of, okay, just for people's basic health and safety, do we need to like put a freight elevator down there that we can fit a gurney onto? because it's gonna be a long ambulance ride down to a hospital. There's, there's no town, there's no settlement, there's nothing up on this mesa except for this national park, okay? So these are the kinds of questions, these are the balances you gotta strike as a park ranger, understanding that if you just have a rustic ladder, like was probably period appropriate to the Chacoans who lived at Cliff Palace or lived near Cliff Palace and use that as like their cultural administrative site or like their church kind of thing. We could put that ladder down and have another ladder at the other end for people to climb out on, knowing that a few people are going to die of heart attacks. Or we can dynamite in a freight elevator that can fit a hospital gurney and permanently alter the site to do that. Like we did at Mammoth Cave. There is a freight elevator at Mammoth Cave. There are two flush toilet bathrooms at Mammoth Cave. There's a full-size cafeteria where until recently you could go and pay like 10 bucks for a sandwich. Underground. Like 75 feet underground. Why? Because the Park Service is having to answer the question of who do we want to be? Not just as a country like we were talking about earlier, but who do we want to be as people in charge of parks for all generations for all time from here forward? until the end of the United States of the heat death of the universe, whichever comes first. So, very, very non-trivial questions. Pay attention. This is the kind of scenario, the kind of trade-off question that doesn't have a single clear, obvious answer. These are the questions that are valuable to ask of your national park as we get into the tail end of our semester. Make sense? All right, cool. So, moving on. What we can do, our management response or our strategies, first, limit use. And we've been saying so far that limiting use out of our four big strategies, that is increasing the supply in real or effective terms, or modifying the resource to be less impacted, more resistant to impact, more resilient from impacts, or modifying visitor use to be more sustainable by changing the activity directly or indirectly, changing the impacts, changing the timing of those impacts. Well, 
those three strategies we've been saying so far, those are the good ones. But at a place like Mesa Verde, where you have no room for error, you cannot accept even one stone getting knocked off where it should be, where it was placed originally. You have to go to limiting use. Okay, So there are lots of times when you physically are not allowed to go down to an access cliff palace, even though walking in that spot is a very, very famous, very short, but very famous thing to do. That sounds like an experience or an experiential resource in our vocabulary for this semester. So this is tough. We are trading away our, your and mine, everybody else's ability to take a look at, to stand in the steps of people who built Cliff Palace, to understand personally, in your skin, experientially, what it was like to live and be a human being at Cliff Palace. We're trading that away in order to protect Cliff Palace from us or at least the subset of us that are doing depreciative behaviors, okay? So, what that limitation of use followed by reduction of the impact of use or hardening the resource against impacts in the first place, how those actually take shape. So, stepping down from that high-level strategy, that four-fold strategy, down to a more tactical level, looks like management practices. We can put in some specific rules. Okay, so nine months out of the year, maybe, we can go down to Cliff Palace. And three months out of the year, it's a high elevation spot, higher elevation spot. It's really cold. And if there's any dew, it can be pretty slippery on those wooden ladders. So we're just going to close down tours from November through February. And if that's when you wanted to visit it, sorry, plan a different trip. Okay. Law enforcement presence at Mesa Verde is a little bit more, here's a 10 sum word for you, I read this one down, obtrusive. Obtrusive is a specific technical term that contrasts with unobtrusive and comes from the same root word as intrude. And the prefix ob means against. So if something is obtrusive, it means getting in your face, obvious, right in front of you, like in your personal area, in your bubble, okay? That's obtrusive. So law enforcement, presence patrols might be a little bit more aggressive feeling at Mesa Verde because we need to send a very clear message that, hey, this is not a place where we can afford to be sort of flexible about some of this stuff. If any damage happens to any of these 600 plus archaeology sites, that's permanent. Forever. We can't go back. So, I'm going to let people know, hey, we're happy that you're here. We are running this park for you. But we are also running it to preserve this place permanently and as perfectly as we can forever. So, you can see the law enforcement rangers at Mesa Verde. They're just a little bit more obvious. They're not all way off in the backcountry. They're not generally staying at dispatch and dispatching to answer calls. They're out patrolling and visibly patrolling more than at some other places. Okay. So the site design is one of our key tools here. Our infrastructure is everything. If we move a trail 100 meters left or right that's the difference between an archaeology site that that trail goes by being visible at all or not visible at all and if it is visible at all someone's going to check it out maybe not everybody and maybe not everybody checks it out damages the place but some of them will some of them not even meaning to some of them meaning to damage the site. So, very, very critical decisions happening out of simple stuff like 
Does my trail kind of wiggle to the west or wiggle to the east in this area? What do we want to put this particular section of the trail? Well, it would be kind of a slabby trail, so ISO elevational, not climbing or dropping elevation. Uh, if we kind of moved it eastward a little bit around this, sort of following the curve of the wash, the creek. But that brings us, it puts people's sight lines right onto this rock alcove, and I know somebody's going to climb up there and get into it, so maybe we make the trail steeper, a little bit less sustainable, um, dealing with more erosion with a steeper trail, but that keeps it, the sight line of that spot, much further away. Doesn't give people that releaser cue or that psychological prompt to go scramble off the trail and into an archaeology site, okay? Huge, huge critical thing in site design. So we're going to go pretty hard on this as we get further into human resources and then maintaining sites and so forth. Rationing and allocation. Doesn't sound like any fun, but it's a pretty powerful tool. So if you are planning on coming on summer camp in 2024, um, I don't know, sometime this week or next, I'm going to have our first informational meeting to put out a couple of different itineraries that Michael and a couple of uh, fellow students have put together that we might go on east, west, north, south, southeast, etc. And we're going to have to compete for some campsites on some of those itineraries. So your intrepid professor, after kissing his exceedingly beautiful wife, is going to spend some time January 1st, 12.03 a.m. logging onto the Park Service's permitting website to nail down a couple of permits that are going to be gone by about 1 a.m. on January 1st. That's a use allocation, rationing, lottery, permit, kind of, kind of high control system, okay? And when you're the park service and you run this entire mesa, you have, on paper at least, perfect, complete control over how many people get in, when they get in, where they go, how long they have before they gotta leave, and what they can do at any particular spot inside. So if you're kind of a anal retentive, like type A, like to tell people where to go, what to do, stuff like that, like this is your jam, you know? But we're gonna use these tools pretty much to make sure that things are fair, at least as fair as we can, because part of the experiential opportunity for every park, not just Mesa Verde, but every place, the over 400 different units that the National Park Service runs across the United States and minor outlying territories. Some of them could be pretty expensive, right? A few of the parks make a ton of money on stuff like five bucks for every vehicle coming in, you know? And a whole bunch, a lot more sites as it turns out, are way in the red. They're not making any money at all. They're losing money, so to speak. So some of that revenue goes from the rich sites to the poorer sites. And we use stuff like rationing and allocation and reservation and permit systems to make sure that the high demand rich sites are still available to everybody. At least everybody's got the equal initial opportunity. Um, there's some information arbitrage that just naturally happens, like knowing you got to wake up at midnight on January 1st and get on a reservation system. That is not fair, but the Park Service, you know, they're going to do the best they can. Zoning is going to be a tactic where we are setting different parts of any particular park up for specific uses at specific times of year. So, for example, if we take a look back at the overall map of Mesa Verde, well, you can see by the distribution of the architecture that a couple of spots are pretty intensively used. There's a whole bunch of labels, POIs, points of interest, clustered in a few spots, right? So we've got the major access road, we've got some camping, we've got some visitor center stuff and usually those are in separate places 
so that you can say this zone, this area, is for hiking. And this area over here is for mountain biking. And that mountain bike trail is physically isolated from this other really nice trail system that we have for the horses. Because mountain bikes make horses heckin' flip out, as the youth might say. Okay? So zoning is going to be a pretty key strategy for us to get some good work done. And these days, done well, zoning is kind of transparent. If it's done well, you don't think about it as a visitor. You just show up and it's like, oh, this is the mountain biking area. Okay, let's go mountain biking. Or this is the horseback riding area. This looks like a nice trail, but if this is the horsebacking trail, then I don't want to walk down this trail because I don't want to get run down by a bunch of horses going crazy on top of me. Okay? So these management practices like these are the answers to the final exam if that makes sense running our scenarios figuring out what would you do in your park these are the answers at every park we're going to have a lot of this information and education because education is right there in the legislation the 1916 organic act that created the park service in the first place when park rangers wake up in the morning, they know that I'm going to have to do some education today. Okay. So, here's how those particular tactics work out in very specific application at Mesa Verde. So, at the application level of the tactic, the third level down from those four big strategies, we got more specific tactics under each of those strategies. So permits, rationing, allocation, those are all forms of limiting use or determining when and where use can happen under modifying use. The applications may not be the right answer for your park. In fact, they may be actively destructive. If you took the right answer for Mesa Verde and put it into place at Acadia National Park because they're completely different ecosystem types. They're completely different visitation profiles as well, okay? So, while the previous slide has a whole bunch of answers to the final exam, this one helps to uncover the wisdom of selecting out of that list on the previous slide for your part, okay? This shows you how and how not to pick from among those particular tactics. And there are hundreds of different tactics under those four big strategies, okay? So, rules and regs in law enforcement. The tours of Cliff Palace, they're kind of expensive, and they're kind of slow. You walk like, I don't know, you go down 30 feet on a ladder, and then you walk like 150 yards maybe, something like that, 200 yards, and then you go up like a 25-foot ladder, and that's the whole walking tour. But the whole thing takes like, I don't know, an hour, something like that. And the only way you are going down that ladder and up the other ladder is in the presence of not one uniform ranger, but there's one in front of you. Typically there's one doing the talking, like pointing out this building was for XYZ and this is a Kiva and this is what it was used for. And then there's another ranger at the caboose of the train, making sure that there are no stragglers just wandering off and hanging out in Cliff Palace while everybody else is back up on the Mesa, okay? It is a closed access place. This is exactly how Mammoth Cave is managed and much for the same reason. It's an extremely fragile, irreplaceable site. Any kind of impact can cost millions of dollars to fix. And some impacts can't be fixed. So it's not like you're getting perp walked, you know? It's not like you're being managed like a federal prisoner or something like that going on this hike. It's just that you're low-key being managed like a prisoner on one of these hikes, okay? And it's a really interesting and cool and fun hike, but the fact is they just have no margin for error, so they're going to be super hardcore about it, and they will close this down for any reason. Um, they're just, like, my goofy fantasy is there's somebody at the Mesa Verde headquarters just, like, drinking too much coffee and rocking back and forth and going, motherfucker, I wish you would, just so they could close down the tour, just to, just to close it down. You know? That's not actually it at all. They're actually very cool people at um, Mesa Verde. We've had some cool talks with them. But um, in terms of 
rehabilitating and protecting the resource, so stepping aside from the experience of it, doing the archaeology and the restoration work of the ruins. Um, this wasn't designed or built by modern soil engineers or concrete engineers, right? This or dry masons. This was. Um, I mean, this is hand fitted by a bunch of folks living in semi arid conditions like eight, nine hundred years ago, right? So, part of it is sort of creeping down the mountainside, sheet erosion, sloughing, subsidence. Um, and walking tours through there does not help that process. In a positive way, it accelerates that process in a bad one. So, stabilization of the site, figuring out, okay, um, do we need to use something like a low-key color matched concrete where there is a path kind of at the outer or lower edge of Cliff Palace where modern people walk? And is that a valid answer for stopping this whole place from slowly just like sliding down and out? And when a stone structure starts to crack and crumble, it can be a pretty quick uh, destructive process from that point forward. So they have to constantly reassess this place, constantly rebuilding something constantly shoring something up, but as much as, as physically possible, they got to do it in period accurate, authentic ways. So you might be, if you're really interested in dry masonry and you work with a park service, this is one of the places you might deploy to for four months, six months to help consult, to teach the on-site folks and uh, very specialized contractors okay this is exactly how I need you to do this because this is how it is done All right pretty cool stuff there's a real opportunity for excellence here if you like seeing things done perfectly for all the right reasons and then for that rationing allocation and information education um, the interpretive programs we have a whole bunch of signs. We have a whole bunch of junior ranger guidebooks and pamphlets. We have a whole bunch of maps and booklets and full-size books about the archaeology and the cultural history and the anthropology of the site. And just tours constantly. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every hour. 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. every hour and 9.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m., right? People are coming here to, to see this stuff. That's the experiential resource. And then the infrastructure is staffing that tour. The infrastructure is you, the ranger, taking a month to just come to work every day for your first month there as a ranger and spend some time in the Park Service's historical archives and library on site. Look at thousands of photos and archaeological survey images and diagrams and just learn everything you can so that yeah, after that first month or so you can turn around and you can lead a hike for an hour and field people's questions and have valid functional well-supported answers because people are normally and appropriately curious about this stuff right what they're learning about this place informs what they know about themselves what we know about ourselves the park has decided it um, divided into two kind of main missions and that zoning approach make sure that for everybody who's coming with the two most common reasons for showing up the two most common motivations seeing the cliff palace and enjoying some of those so like really hot semi-arid backcountry hiking sections you can actually check those out right go on some of those staff tours or get away from all of that stuff if you've seen the cliff palace tour once You've kind of seen the Cliff Palace tour, so it's not really changing very much. Uh, some folks like to get up there, and because it's a little bit out of the way, if you go to the backcountry section of this and go for a hike, you have that whole backcountry section of a whole national park kind of to yourself. That's a pretty cool opportunity. It sounds like a pretty cool experiential resource. Okay? So, very cool stuff. All right. So, that's taken us through what are our four big strategies, everything from limiting use to increasing supply of the resource in real or effective terms, right? Two very opposite ends of the strategy spectrum, down through some tactics, stuff like zoning. So allocating different activities or uses to different physical areas or zones of the park or units of a park. Down to 
the very specific, okay, we've got our front country, guided tour, cliff palace zone, and then we have a whole bunch of miles of backcountry trails, and that's kind of our other big zone. So, does that make sense? All right, when you are doing park management professionally, you have to adopt a framework like these four strategies and be real up on all the tactics that fit into each of those strategies and have very, very, very clear reasons for why you chose the specific application of the specific tactics under the broad strategy that you chose. Because your publics, the people that are employing you, have a right to disagree with those choices. Does that make sense? Okay. So at Ozark Scenic Riverways, the canoe concessioners, when they disagree with the Park Service's decisions about how many canoes, how many tubes are we going to let on the water, how many companies are we going to let let people on the water, where can they do it, how many per day, how many per year, well, that sounds like a pretty nasty uh, limitation on American free enterprise, right? The government telling me what I can and can't do with my business. If I live in southern Missouri and my livelihood is renting out canoes, well, the Park Service had to explain in court before judges, federal judges, who don't mess around. Uh, if you guys are watching the news lately, judges are super front and center right now with our former president. Um, you have to explain to the public and you have to justify that explanation with a bunch of data, right? So SIU forestry professors back in the day, like a generation before us, um, had to testify in court. This is why we advise the Park Service to have this kind of a use rationing system on this section of the current river because this user count was high enough according to questions we asked of people on the river. People felt like, yeah, this is too crowded. I don't know how many fun right here. Or this doesn't make me feel safe to have this many people ricocheting off of me continuously as I'm going down the river. I was trying to go through this sharp curve and there's a strainer right there and two other canoes hit me and I went broadside against the strainer and flipped the canoe and lost a bunch of my gear. And if there weren't so many other people on that section of river right there, right when I was there, it would have been fine. Like it's not that dangerous of a spot until you have too many people. And the federal judge in that particular case with Ozark agreed with that assessment because the Park Service wasn't just making up their approach. So in this class, we can't just make up our approach. We're gonna have a specific strategy, a specific tactic or tactics arranged in order of obtrusiveness, how in your face, how hardcore, how hard ass they are, and the specific application of those tactics for your park on site to address a particular problem. Okay? Okay. Did anybody select Mesa Verde as their park? Just out of curiosity. All right. Cool. So, a whole bunch of answers today for you. All right. Good deal. Make sure to get this class recording. Man, you're basically done. Anyway. No, just kidding. Um, but yeah, very helpful. Any questions either about Mesa Verde in specific or about this idea of, okay, we've got these human cultural resources. We've got these human experiential resources, kind of a, a conceptual sort of a resource. Like, what's our answer to people's motivation for showing up? What opportunities are we going to hand them? And any, th any questions about infrastructure resources so far? Um, what section is this PowerPoint under on the course website? On the course website. Let's pull it up. So for our recording, the question is, what section is this area under? So this section is in a different area than all of our previous ones so far. This is not a physical natural resource. This is going to be something else. So let's make sure I've got this properly organized for you. And if I don't, I'm going to have to do some work. So if you go to the content section of the website, 